Heavenly Father's love for his children has been manifested to us in many different ways throughout history. While this is true, his rigid hand and attitude towards obedience is set forth and made clear in all of Scripture. It's clear that God doesn't mind punishing his people or stirring them up to a remembrance to be in a humbling state before blessing us. But sometimes the scriptures read like he can take things like a little too far before giving us an eventual blessing. Um, and it's a common thought among those in and out of Christendom that God is harsh and, and is unpredictable because of it, because we see a lot of people being disobedient, but not changing their ways. Hence, God can't give them the blessings upon um, obedience, which is where blessings are predicated upon. And it's a common occurrence for anyone, like I said, to read the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, and see an angry God, a God is who irrational, who's awaiting our mistakes and enjoys coming down upon his children in wrath. A couple common Bible stories that provoke these kinds of feelings are like Noah and the Ark, where God seemingly has a total disregard for human life, or the seemingly uncalled for punishment of Lot's wife, where she just looks back to see her buddies die and she turns into a pillar of salt, or like God helping the Israelites wipe out the Canaanites just because it was the Israelites' promised land. You know, these are just, you know, small takes on stories that are that might raise an eyebrow or might make people think that hey maybe god this isn't the loving god that you know the missionaries teach me about or the god that seems like he would want to answer my prayer but there are many more happenings where god has given severe consequences for disobedience or enabled seemingly bad things to happen and it can generate an overall cold feeling towards one's attitude and perception of god it's kind of my purpose today in my talk to illustrate how god's love far outweighs his wrath and to give some context to a punishment that may help us understand how God sees the bigger picture and eternal impacts far more than we do. Because understanding that God sees everything more holistically than we do will deter us from casting judgments upon his actions, which I think is wise to not judge deity for their actions. But I will do this by giving the example of God flooding the earth and killing all of mankind, save eight souls who were saved by water, these eight souls being Noah and his family. Um, I serve a mission in Australia, and this issue was brought up to me. I was asked the question, how could a God that loves us really kill all of his children on the earth? Except for one family that he deemed worthy enough to live. So, as a result, they would either discredit the story or discredit the Bible, or they'd kind of conceptualize a God that they already didn't believe in to be one they definitely wouldn't want to believe in. Now, it's a fair argument, because just looking at it like this is what I summarized it as, it does seem kind of messed up. But a developing an eternal perspective lens helped me see how the flood was an ultimate expression of love, and I'll kind of go into that now. So Genesis 6 describes that, just speaking to as man as a whole, it gives the tense kind of more sense. It says that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and that violence filled the earth. I believe that we can't really imagine how wicked the world was back then today. You know, we think we live in wicked and perverse times, but the wickedness of man yielding God to flood the whole earth must have been very gruesome and indescribable. So they were very wicked because our punishments of, you know, maybe famines and fires are bad, but nothing compared to God flooding the whole earth. Um, an excerpt from John Taylor helped me a lot to kind of understand, you know, God's perspective and the eternal perspective on the flood. He mentioned that their wickedness was generations deep. So it wasn't just a wicked group of people or a wicked, you know, a wicked generation. It was generations deep. It was being taught from fathers to sons. And that those people did have their free agency and God could not take that away from them. That being said, because God does love them, he couldn't take away their free agency, but he could do what he, he could do his best. So he would send prophets because he recognized that, um, he could send prophets to try to help them and stir them up to remembrance, kind of like what I was saying before. And Professor Amy Jill Levine inc includes that people are made in the image of God, um, and sending a flood wouldn't be just because he does love us. We are his children, and we're made in his likeness. She explains that this is why he sent prophets. This is why Noah was called. He had previously given them the laws of which they were, of which blessings are predicated as well. So, you know, God had these people who were very wicked, and he knew that they were valuable. So, Amy Levine, you know, includes that this is why 
This is why prophets were sent, um, because it wouldn't be justice to, to, to kill them. And not only were prophets were sent, but the law had been given, and the law had been followed and blessings were received, but they had just, you know, fallen off the path. It, it wasn't, they weren't doing the formula that has proven to work. And Noah declared this and the consequences, warned them of the flood, but as you read in Moses, that they hearkened not unto his words. And it's the pattern of God to call more than one prophet over the course of a time to warn them as well. So we can assume that he probably did that, but they did not repent. So God intervened as much as, as much as he could, but they would not change because they had their free agency. So this brings the attention of all of us in the pre-mortal world. So there was many of our spirit brothers and sisters who are going to be sent to grow up in this world, a world without hope, or we wouldn't have a glimmer of hope to be righteous. You know, this purpose of this life is to save ordinances, to become better, become more refined, um, you know, to, to utilize the priesthood, to learn how to become, you know, eventually like our Father in heaven. And, you know, our spirit brothers and sisters, they saw that this is not the world, that they were. this is not a reality for them. Sending his children to these circumstances would only be heartbreaking for them, but it wouldn't even be just, let alone merciful. Burying the wicked in the flood was a merciful manifestation of love because it not only prevented those on the earth from, from committing more perverse sins, but it allowed all of us in the pre-mortal world to have a chance to receive, to achieve our purpose of coming to earth. He flooded the earth because he loved man too much to send us to a world without hope and to prevent further acts of wickedness. We read in the scriptures that, you know, the sins of the children will be upon the father's head. And by flooding the earth, that puts a lot less sin on the, the father's head. So this one example, just looking into the context of a seemingly harsh act, helped me personally understand God's ever-loving nature. On top of that, because of Jesus Christ's infinite sacrifice and atonement, God extended those people another chance to repent, um, another chance in the spirit world, as you read in, in Second Peter, that they were preached the gospel by God's Son, Jesus Christ, as another showing of love. And this leads me to identify kind of the next way we can know God's love for us far surpasses any negative emotion he may feel towards us. For he sent his son to die for us. And as John and Romans read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this is taught from our first day in primary, and it will be taught probably at our funerals. So I'm not going to exhaust this point much further, but God sending his son down to the earth to endure agony and suffering on behalf of his other children, us, and providing the mode of which we can be saved from our sins, and then desiring for this mode to be preached to every living soul it can be preached to is the greatest expression of love we could ever ask for. And while Christ was on the earth, he wasn't as much a third party with a mind of his own as he was an instrument in God's hand. Everything he did on this earth was a portrayal of God's love, to his children. Mark Strauss taught that an ancient Jewish philosopher named Philo identified the word, word, okay, he identified the word, the meaning of the word, word, in the context of John 1, which reads, the word was God, derived from the word logos. I know that's how it's pronounced, but I can't remember how it's actually pronounced. Logos. And Philo, the ancient Jewish philosopher, identified this term as the messenger of God, or like the mediator between God and creation. And this aligns perfectly with the belief that Jesus' actions on the earth were a sort of means by which God showed his love towards his people. Christ's miracles, compassion towards the sinner, love for little children, and quickness to forgive are all God's character displayed in his Son, Jesus Christ. And this, and this aligns perfectly with the belief that Jesus Christ's actions on the earth were, um, were just a manifestation of God's love towards us, as well as um, Jesus said that he is the true bread from heaven, and with, an and with an analytical scriptural mind, we can understand that the bread as being the fruits, the blessings, a likeness of what heaven is, meaning that Christ's love is just a taste of what heaven is like. Moreover, Andreas J. Kostenberger and John Baker exegetical commentary of the Bible 
took from this that the father and the son they don't simply just kind of coexist together kind of like kind of like a father or a son or just a man and a normal woman but it's more of an idea that they have an active relationship or intercourse with one another they're not independent of each other they're together in all the individual works that they do you could really say that jesus was his father's son boom god man. the last point i'd like to point out that struck me the most is from christ's life is the sermon on the mount i had never really taken much time to understand the sermon of the mount a whole lot i thought it was kind of just a nice teaching that people who only have the bible have and that the people at that time had about you know prayer and good attributes and stuff like that but when i was reading um amy joe levine's kind of section on it and just reading it in the lord's prayer i it really struck me in a different manner than it did especially with you know this project in mind but the first thing that struck to me is that christ instructs us to pray he takes quite a decent chunk of the sermon on the mount teaching us to pray in matthew 6 <clears throat> He teaches us how grand, how, you know, a God as grand as he is, he wants to hear our prayers and to make them personal. Um, in Christ's arguably longest and most distinct teaching, like, like I said, there's a good portion about how we should pray and commune with our Father. If he didn't love us, um, he definitely wouldn't want to hear, hear us. But it was important enough that he, he, he taught us to pray and how to pray, and that we don't pray for man, but we pray for ourselves. A second part of the sermon that displays Heavenly Father's unconditional love for us is that the entire beginning of it teaches us about those who are on the margins of society. You know, personally, I'm 21. I, I have a family. I have friends. I have a girlfriend. I served a mission. I, you know, I'm at BYU. I have, I have an okay life. I know that there's some people out there that, that do love me. But the beginning part of the Sermon on the Mount is for those people that probably don't feel loved by anyone, those who are on the margins of society, people who are less likely to not be loved, but not even liked by anyone. And God, he, you know, him and Jesus Christ, I mean, this is the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, to make sure that they feel loved, to make sure that, you know, they do have a reward in heaven. He made his first priority to ensure that those who are afflicted abused, mistreated, lonely, or in other som sombering circumstances are loved, and they will be, you know, given those rewards. He loves those who are perceived to be hard to be loved by us, and he loves them per perfectly and completely, and it's obvious he wanted to make that clear. You know, Christ made that clear, but we just learned that they work together, that, you know, one's actions are just as a reflection of the other's actions. That they they work together they're connected that jesus is the bread the bread of heaven and i think that's just beautiful and all the truths from these scriptures about how god loves us have applications to our personal lives um, you know for me and for us in general we have to go through periods of darkness in our lives where you know having questions of eternal importance plague our minds or it's hard for us to feel god's love or we're just kind of going through the ringer a little bit, and it's mentally understand, hard to understand how God may love us. But as time passes, I've either, as I've personally exercised faith, and I've, as I've kept trying to be obedient, I am able to return to faith in my Maker, and that I know that He knows me by my name, by my name, and that He does love me. And you know, if we just focus at you know those low points in our life, it's like if we focus at the low points in the Old Testament, it might seem like you know, God's not as involved or as loving as he should be. But uh, but just like in our personal lives, I know that as long as we keep at it, that we will be able to feel God's love and that he will bless us and that there's always a bigger picture. There's always a bigger picture um, to take into account, just like I kind of explained with the flood. And I leave this testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.